Hello and welcome to our time. Our guest has been an actor, teacher, TV performer and producer. He's written a curriculum for schools here in Australia, the UK and the Middle East and has the most unusual hobby and his life story is fascinating. <laughs> so let's find out more. Welcome Ian Smythe. Welcome, welcome. Hello Malcolm, good to be here. Oh, it's good to be anywhere, really, at our well, age, is, you must it. admit. Now, that's a good line. I've heard that one before. Well, isn't it funny just that you said that? So many politicians say, <laughs> it's good to be here. It's like, what about hello? Yeah. Mm. Anyway, that's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. We're surrounded with these lovely old radios, which I know is your hobby, uh -huh. but we'll save the explanation until later in the program, because... You did so much in television here in South Australia before you went to the UK. Why did you go to the UK? Well, actually, it was slightly the other way around. I went oh. to the UK first. And oh, then, did you? And then I learnt, slipped into television while I was in England and then oh, came okay. back to work for the Nine Network here. Right. But I, I um, was a drama student at Flinders and Sturt College and uh, I graduated and went out teaching for a year. And, and then how old were you then? I was 20, about 24, perhaps, around okay. about that age. Yep. Yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, 1974, so it was, I was 24. Okay. Well, well, but you went back to the UK after working no, here? No, no, I, I um, well, no, I was, I was born here and did oh, all my yes. education here and then... Well, maybe we yeah. should go yeah. back to the beginning and yeah. do it chronologically, <laughs> because now I'm confused. Right. And that's not difficult. <laughs> so you started off as a child, as we all do. That's correct, yeah. Were you interested in performance when you were a kid? Well, I, got it, I really enjoyed it at school, actually. We, I went to Adelaide Boys High School and we had a fantastic music teacher who was a member of um, State Opera and he did a school production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Ruddy Gore. And I right. got a part in it. I'd never done anything like that before. Go on, tell me you were the girl. No, 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 not, <laughs> not, that, not that time. No. <laughs> not that time. I've interviewed yeah. quite a few people who've admitted to the fact they went to a boys' school and ended up playing. No, no, we them. had girls from Adelaide Girls High School, oh, which is in Groat Street in those days. Yes, so we, um, the two schools came together for our productions. And uh, I got bitten by the bug there, I guess. And then I went on and did uh, drama at, at, um, at college and became a drama and media studies teacher. Well, well while you were doing that, yep. did you start performing then as well? That's right, yes, because one of my lecturers was Gordon Folds. Right. And Gordon was... Uh, Gordon was a choreographer at Channel 9 in the very early days yes, with yes. the Channel 9 dancers. That's right, and so he worked with um, the Old King's Music Hall in yep. the city. In Where those, we all worked. That's right, we all worked, we worked together there. And um, so Gordon, who was my lecturer at college, was doing a production of a, a, a wedding reception play called Dimbula. I uh, did the set for it. Yes, it that's right. And uh, that was written by Jack Hibbard, who was an Australian playwright, and I got to play the role of Maury McAdam, who was the groom. Oh, okay. In the We've actually reception. got a photo of we the do. program of this. Yes, yep. With you on the front. That's me, yes. <laughs> and Wendy Patching being your bride. She was indeed, yes. yes. It's, there it is. There's, mm. the, there's the original. Uh, good that you kept this, because these things are sort of disappearing, these memories, if well, you like. Thanks to my mother, really, because it was not long after that that I went to live in England, and uh, she kept this scrapbook of different cuttings and bits and pieces, and um, that's where it was when I came back. Well, you also did that, but you also did some other plays. Yes, yes. When, because, sadly, the Old King's Music Hall burnt down. It did, Which yeah. is often the fate of a theatre. Mm, mm. And uh, you transferred shows then from there to... To the, uh, the, the old Castle Hotel on South Road. Um, it's been demolished now. It's a shopping mall. Now it's a shopping mall, but yeah. it was a lovely big hotel. And in the middle there was a ballroom which had been converted into a theatre restaurant. And so the shows that were going to be at the Old King's moved to the castle. Right. And the first one that we did there was um, a musical from World War One called Back to the Front. Right. And, and we've got a shot of you in yes. that as well. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, these things are sort of treasured by us, but they're also great memories of what entertainment used to be. Like when you mentioned theatre restaurants, mm, they don't, there people aren't would any eat anymore. a meal and yeah. watch a show. Yes. They yeah. don't really exist in that form anymore. No. So in that previous shot, you were on the left. Uh -huh. And in this other shot that we've got of you... Mm -hmm. Where are you? <laughs> I don't know. There you are. You're yep. again second again, from the left. I'm the tall, gormless one in the middle of the group at, on the left. Right. And, um, yeah, that was a, a good comedy. It was a um, good chance to sing. Oh, there um, you are again, yep. holding the rifle. Yep. And uh, another good friend of ours, 
is on my left is Eugene Ragianti. Yes. Who also worked at the Old Kings. Yes. In fact, in fact, anyone in Adelaide at that time had worked together at some point because it was quite a healthy scene, wasn't it? It was indeed, yeah. But then yeah. you really took education to the schools. Mm, yeah. What was that called? That was um, a, a theatre and education team. The um, Troika. 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 Troika Theatre and Education Team. Right. Yep. So the Department of Education wanted to have a team of people who were trained teachers as well as trained actors to go to schools and do school performances. And there were two teams formed. The first one was the primary school team, which I was in, called Troika. Then there was a secondary school one called uh, Magpie Theatre Company. And uh, one of our ABC announcers for many years, Julia Lester, was a member of the secretary team right. at the same time. Well, for the people in Melbourne, uh, one of the things about moving sort of theatre into the public was a government incentive at the time as mm -hmm. well, mm. because... <laughs> Um, we went out with Eugene Raganti actually to do plays at in the lunch hour yeah. in factories, mm. and most lunch hours were only three quarters of an hour long, and the play was an hour long. So yep. three quarters, they all get on, went back to work, <laughs> and we were left there playing to the staff behind the counter. And funny uh, things that happen mm, when you think mm, back. Mm. What happened next? So then I, I, uh, I wanted to learn more about theatre and education and I also wanted to travel overseas, which most young Australians did in those days. Yep. So uh, in 1976, I packed my bags and, and uh, left and went to try and do an audition for the, the whole theatre and education team in the UK, for which I was unsuccessful. And um, so I just had a bit of a holiday in Europe and England for uh, about 10 months. And then finally I got a job with the BBC in a training studio up north in Carlisle on the border between England and Scotland, right. where, which is a very similar situation to we have here in this studio where we have students coming to learn what film television. What do you mean studio? This is my house. Is it? Didn't you realise that? It's so, it's so good, Malcolm. I, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> it's a pity it's only one-sided. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of being able to teach in a studio, isn't mm, it? That's right, yep. So it was first-hand practical information. And um, my role was to work with the, the students on school broadcasting and children's television. And so that's where I got into it. And then in 19... must have been... yeah, 80, 82... Um, I'd met my wife by then and uh, we had two boys and we came back to live in Adelaide. And is that when you became part of the Curiosity Show? That's, well, first of all, I, I became producer of Here's Humphrey right. for, the, for the Nine Network. Yep. I did that for two years and then I was lucky enough to be asked to take over the Curiosity Show. Right. Well, which had been running for some time and was very successful. Just have a look at this, because this really <laughs> takes us back, seeing Jason and Kylie. Yeah, on the front and cover. It's wonderful that just you need to mention those names and everybody knows who we're talking about. And there is the... There's the article. Yes. But what's lovely about this is that I also have, that you brought to show us, this... Hang on while I do a quick changeover is the original shot that that's Simon right. Stansbury take. He did indeed, yes. There you yep. go. And that's when Curiosity Show won uh, the, the Penguin Award as the best children's program in Australia. Right. Which well, it won many times. That's Dean. Um, Dean whoops, Hutton there. and Rob that's Morrison. That's Dean there, Rob Morrison in the middle. Who's that bloke with dark hair? Well, that's me, when I was young and beautiful. Oh, you must have dyed your hair for this program. <laughs> Yes. Who would ever do a thing like that? The grey, grey is very hard to do properly. Uh, yes, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> now, but, but talking about those days in TV, mm -hmm. they were very interesting days, weren't oh, they? Because it was fantastic. Because everyone was still sort of flying by the seat yeah. of their pants. Mm -hmm. Still learning. Still, it was just completely different. It was, I'd come through a BBC but f formal model, came to Nine, which was quite uh, more relaxed, and, um, uh, and uh, it was... We were given a lot more creative freedom to do the things that we wanted to do. And working with Dean and Rob, we, we, we planned about six months in advance and um, uh, those shows were really good. And we were looking at what was happening in, in science in schools. Yes. And, um, a, a huge influence. It oh, was it, a huge influence. It was. It was. And one of the things that was really interesting was the drop-off in age group of kids who watched the Curiosity Show, in girls in particular, almost exactly married the, the drop-off in girls doing science and mathematics in schools. So that, we knew, was an area that, that needed to have some attention. So the hands-on science that Curiosity Show was famous for and spawned a lot of hands-on science centres around Australia was really good. But then we needed to think about 
how you know, would girls be engaged in that as much as boys were? And uh, towards the end of Curiosity Show, we started to look at what are some of the other models that we might do. And I remember we went to Singapore filming for two weeks with Dean and Rob. And while we were there, we shot a whole lot of like, more like social history, social science stories rather than the, the pure hands-on science mm -hmm. and married the two together. And that program uh, won an award as well, which was good. Brilliant. You know, the effect that that program has had, though, on basically science in Australia has mm. been profound. It has. Mm. Um, I was telling you before, recently we had a show in my theatre during the Adelaide Fringe from Melbourne and the two guys in conversation, I was fishing a bit to find out mm. what caused them to do this science program and it was the Curiosity Show. Yeah. What's really interesting is that when Curiosity Show finished, there was a, um, a period of hiatus and then when Channel 9 sold the rights to some of its past work, Dean and Rob actually bought the rights to all of the old Curiosity Show material. And now, today, you can go onto YouTube and there is a Curiosity Show channel. And a lot of the, the, the studio segments have been cut up into two and three minute segments. And they are on, uh, on YouTube, How around brilliant. the world, and they are rating very well indeed. But not only that, but they, uh, when they went to other cultures or other languages, mm -hmm. you dubbed them. Yes. Yes, curiosity. Did you dub them or did... No, no. Uh, 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 I think it was DDR1, which was the German channel. They, right. They came to Australia. They looked at what we were doing in the studio and they bought Curiosity Show and uh, then they got their own actors in back in Germany to dub Dean and Rob's voices into the program. Amazing. Yeah, and I've got a couple, well, at least one of those episodes at home, which is... Um, well, we're going to talk yeah. a lot more about yeah. your hobby, which is which we're surrounded with, and we'll come back in just a tick. Our guest on our time this time is Ian Smythe. Oh, I could almost make a song out of that. <laughs> Ian, um, we've surrounded with these lovely old radios mm. and you've had this amazing career as a teacher. Mm. You've been... Um, what we haven't talked about is you're teaching after you were teaching in the UK. Yes. But recently you've been teaching in... Yes. Yeah, my, my wife and I have been... Uh, we went and lived and worked in, in, uh, in the Middle East. We did five years in Qatar, in, in Doha, in Qatar working on a school reform project. See, uh, the Qatar government wanted to reform all of its government schools and so they, they, they liked the Australian and New Zealand model of the way schools are managed. Right. And so they got a team together um, from the Australian Primary Principals Association and Education Queensland and a few other organisations came together. 14 of us went over there and uh, did work with 10 schools each and wow. um, we did a whole lot of professional development with the teachers and or with, especially with the principals and the leadership team in each of those. But you also were in the UAE for And then for, the, the last a 18 months, at the end of my contract, went to the UAE, back into schools doing uh, teacher training on, on the new curriculum. But where were you? What that city? Was in, you? The city was called Alain. So and it's in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, yeah. If you know the, the coastline of the UAE, there yes. is Abu Dhabi to the north and Dubai to the south, and they're about an hour and a half apart. By, yes. But if you did an equilateral triangle inland from those two, you'd come to Alain, which is right on the border with the Sultanate of Oman. And in fact, it's a twin city between Alain and Al Barami. And uh, Alain is 10 oases that have joined together and they've got what it's, it's called the Garden City. It's very beautiful. It's, got, it's just fantastic. And uh, Sheikh Zayed, who was the founder of the UAE, that was his birthplace. And his right. palace and his museum are still there. Are there? Yeah, and so and because it's so it's so comfortable in the summer. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. There's so much air conditioning, my friend. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and they have to refrigerate the swimming pools. Uh, yes, they do. I yeah. love all that. We're yeah. so unfamiliar with that in this yeah. country. But in the middle of Alain, though, there's there's the most amazing um, uh, date palm gardens, and uh, you can walk through there. It can be 50 degrees outside, and it'll be. You know, only about 32, 33, but a, a little more humid. It's incredible. Uh, in it? there, it's lovely. Mm. Yeah, incredible. Mm. Well, let's talk about yes, the radios. Yes, the radios. Because it, it, this one here, is, the, is this the oldest one you've this got? Is the, this, I've just brought in a selection of four or five yes. of the of the. Band. How many have you got, Ian? Oh, I've only got about eight. Oh, is that but all? But some of the members of the club that I belong to have got several hundred. Yes. Mm. The thing is, when, when you see these... You think, oh, really? Are they? Because we're not used to anything that looks like this yeah, anymore. Yeah. So just explain what the two components are. So this, this, is, this, this, this is the Philips radio that was made in 1929. 
Right. And uh, it belonged to my wife's grandfather. And we found it in a shed at her uncle's place behind another radio that had been, had been pushed back 50 years ago and forgotten about. And um, uh, this was the first model of Philips radio that was ever sold in Australia. It's actually built in, in Holland at the right. factory. And this is called a seven-net speaker because it's seven-sided. And um, when we found it, it was pretty dirty and the speaker had disappeared. And um, I just went online, good old YouTube and, yes. and uh, the internet, found the circuit diagram for it and um, slowly, incredible. With, with a couple of friends' help, who are members of the, the, the Historical Radio Society of Australia. Right, and that I, I didn't know to. that existed. Yep. So there's about, yeah, it's in every state in Australia. There's about right. two or 3,000 members. We've got 140 members in South Australia. How and uh, there's about 40 or 50 of us who meet on a regular basis monthly. And talk about radios. And, and swap parts. And oh, OK. Oh, yeah, it's a great great knowledge and resource, these, these blokes but are. But when we, when we think this was really the, the first of home entertainment. It was, yes, yep. And so uh, the, the interesting thing was the valves inside, there are, there are five valves, four of them were still working and only one of them had to be replaced. Where do you find valves today? Ah, well, all the, all the radio and TV shops in Adelaide that slowly went out of business, like Radio Rentals or uh, Iverson's Electrical or whatever, right, yes. had stocks of valves. And when they closed down, a lot of the valves were donated to the club, to the Historical Radio Society. Right. So in a little shop in Sturt Street, we have got 10 to 15,000 valves. How brilliant. Yep. Yeah, so a lot of them are TV valves, of course, because they came along a bit after. But, yes. But I was able to find the missing valve for this radio in that collection that had come from um, a retired person. That's and people say, well, why, yeah, there's no AM radio stations in Adelaide anymore. Well, there is a couple that are still worth listening to. But the good thing about this radio is that on the back, there's an input for a turntable. Now, in 1929, there were ele oh, electrical, there were gramophones. Yes, but Phillips had, up. yeah, I've got one Phillips made the first electric one with an electric motor with a, right. and with a pickup. So there's a point on the back here for a, a pickup so for it. You can plug it in. You can plug it in. How incredible. And so what you can do now is we've developed this little box and I can now plug my little black box into the back of that radio with those Yes. and the other end, Bluetooth to my <laughs> iPhone and I can now stream Spotify, the ABC or whatever, whatever I want, want and that comes out of this lovely 1929 radio. If people back then w even had a concept of what would happen to these <laughs> devices, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because most people chucked them away when the new yeah, models yeah. came. Mm -hmm. So these on this side. On the other side. The, yeah, I love these. The tall square one next to you, that's this called, one. that's also a Philips. That's called a theatrette radio, and that's from 1938. Oh, because it looks like a, a It's stage. got a proscenium arch in the yes, front. Yes, proscenium. Can you see mm. that? Um, look, I'll just move, just bear with me so that you can get a good shot of that because, oops, oh, they're quite heavy. Yes, they are. It's light. See, look at that. Have a look at that because it does. It looks it's like a It's a beautiful theater. radio. Not yeah. this one, the one down there, <laughs> the one that looks like a theatre stage, this one we're talking about because mm. um, I, I suppose they were. I mean, they're almost like the first TVs. Yeah, yep. Mm. Incredible. Although, yeah, the concept of television in 1938 was still pretty new. Now, that radio, I, I've brought these in because each of these has got a story. That's you know, my wife's grandfather's. That yes. one there, my wife and I found in a, a, a street market in Languedoc in, in the, the south of France. Oh, really? Yeah, and we found it in a street market, this old Philips radio. So this is what we've... For, can I pull yeah, that pull out? Yeah, pull that out. Yep, there's some spare parts. This is... Oh. Of course it is. <laughs> this is what used to be there. That's right. Yep. Clunky, but amazing. And those valves are still available and they still work. Extraordinary. Mm. Um, Ian, so what actually got you into doing something like this? I guess some of it actually grew out of Curiosity Show. Oh, I can imagine yeah, why. Yeah, because back in, back in the mid-80s when we were doing Curiosity Show, one of the things that was in, came on was actually home computers. Right, of course. Of course, there was four and the VIC-20 and all that, and Amstrad computers were around. And um, we actually mucked around with them in the studio at Channel 9, and we actually, I think we were the first to actually put the output of a computer live to air. Before, you used to have to have a camera over the shoulder and shoot the screen, and yeah, you'd get right, rolling yes. bars on it, and it looked terrible. Yes, they did. But uh, we actually did some segments with, a, with an Amstrad computer and put it live to air, and I, 
And talk in DOS, no doubt. Oh, yeah, definitely in DOS, yeah, yep. <laughs> And just talk to come a long way, yeah, the, the te technology. That's right, yeah, yeah. And so when I retired about five years ago, I wanted to do a bit more. I just, you know, thought, what will I do with my time? And I'd, had, I'd always built crystal radios when I was a kid as well. Oh, right. Mm. So in 20, must have been uh, about uh, 2016, 17, I went back to TAFE. I went to Regency TAFE here in Adelaide and did a course in electronics so I, I could electro electrocute myself knowingly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, these are things that people tend to do when they've left whatever they did all of their life. Hmm. You've had a hankering to do something and it's an opportunity and I never to had a, do I never it. had time or space to do it before and now I do hmm. and I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm not going to get a collection of three or four hundred radios, just a couple of these just classic 60 ones. 60 or 70? No, 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 just, just the eight that I've got. Like the one over there that you had in your hand before, that's called an Empire State. Look at the shape. That yes, it is. well, it, yes. Mm. It's very 30s looking it's as well. It's an absolute classic piece of Art Deco design. Yes. And it was made here in Australia uh, by AWA in Sydney. And um, it looks like the AWA building is in Sydney, that used to be in Sydney as well. Yes, that's right. They, and they used to have in the building, they used to have an auditorium where people like Jack Dyer yep, and correct. No, Jack Davey yeah, Jack and Davey. Bob Dyer used yes. to present their radio mm, shows. Mm, mm. Incredible mm. how far we've come. Yeah. And then you step forward to the next generation, go to 1966. Oh, this one here. This is. Uh, Hang on, we'll come back and explain that in just a tick. We'll be back in a moment. Our guest has been Ian Smythe, and what wonders we have seen, Ian Smythe, <laughs> including these old radios. But now we were just about to talk about this one before we went to the break. Yeah, this is an um, Australian-made AWA radio. It's called uh, the Model B15, and it came out in 1966. And it was the first Australian radio that was actually industrially designed by a designer. Right. Most, most of the radios you see there, like square brown cabinets with knobs on them. Yes. Made by engineers. Right. <laughs> I'm being facetious. But, no, you know. but you're right. But uh, so radio was at its peak really in the, mid, in the mid-60s. We could have listened to the Beatles on that. Well, that's right, yeah. So an industrial designer was engaged by AWA to, to make this one. And if you have a look, it's, it's, think of what was happening at the time. You know, surfing was big, um, the Beach space boys. race was on. And so it's mm -hmm. got a kind of a space feel to it and like the, the crashing wave and... Um, oh. Oh, uh, that, yes, it yeah, so would have been Lost in Space would have been that, one yeah, of the big right. TV yes, shows yeah. at the time. Exactly, yeah, so uh, that one... I love the fact it's got all the states there. Oh, that's right, they were all made, made for the sound yes. across the country. Some of the early radios only had one state and you had to change the, the badge on the front, but this one had it right. for the whole country. Everything. Mm. But when I got this one, the, the grill on the front was, uh, was, some of it was broken. The two top corner and the bottom corner were broken. There were bolts were missing out of the back. And um, I've restored it inside and it works perfectly. How did you and, fix um, the broken bits? Well, with uh, fiberglass resin and moulding. Oh, okay. Oh, so you did cutting, the, cutting sticks the proper and, thing. Yeah, yeah. Restored it all and then I, then I sprayed it and then I polished it. And, uh, it looks great. It, it looks really like looks great. It looks like genuine plastic. Yes, it does. <laughs> it really does. I love that. Well, because... These, these, are are, these are Bakelite, yes, these are all Bakelite, uh, but that one is plastic. So that's the, that's the other thing that happened in the 60s too. Yes, that, the upgrade of... Uh, well, the modern plastics had really come into their own by mm. then, and um, yeah, so they came in a lot more colours than just... Um, uh, yeah, I've got a green Bakelite one mm, that mm. came from the 50s mm. at home. That Empire State radio over there, if you can find a green one of those, that is the most collectible and the most expensive right. radio. Right, and there was a white, a, like a, an off-white one. There's a mar marbly, marbly, marbly white one. Look, yep. Yes, there's I've a, seen that yep, somewhere. And green, uh, a plain white, and uh, the brown Bakelite. What a fantastic and most unusual hobby to have. I think yeah. that's just fantastic. Thank you. Ian, mm. it's been really lovely to catch up with mm -hmm. you initially. I didn't know you were back home again. Mm. And it's been lovely to talk to you on the program. Well, thank you for inviting me. Good luck with it. If you get some more, bring them back <laughs> and let's have a look at them because these are just yep. wonderful. But because for anybody in our age group, 
watching this program, you it's just sort of taking us back to the things we grew up with. Mm. Well, mm. maybe I wasn't around for that one. Yeah. Although my parents had something very similar to that at I home. bet they did. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, and the bass in them was fabulous and oh, yeah. so yeah. different yeah. to what we have mm. today. And mm. they're winding mm. us up to say goodbye. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this time on our time. So until next time, keep yourself nice till then. Bye.